Good afternoon and welcome to this uh, webinar about quadraquina syndrome. Today is quadraquina syndrome awareness day and it's the first ever national awareness day for quadraquina syndrome. So there's a lot of events uh, taking place today to mark that uh, and to raise awareness of the condition. Um, I'm a, a lawyer specializing in spinal injury claims and especially quadraquina claims. And with me today is uh, Dr. Nish Srikandaraja, uh, who's a neurosurgical registrar um, from the Walton Center NHS Foundation Trust. Um, Nish, do you want to say anything more in your by way of introduction? Yeah, um, so yeah, I'm a neurosurgical uh, trainee over at the Walton Center in Liverpool, and I recently did a PhD um, regarding uh, quadriquina syndrome at the University of Liverpool, and now I'm back into full-time clinical practice. Thanks, Nish. And so Nish is involved in some really fascinating research about outcomes following uh, quadriquina surgery, and uh, we'll be discussing that later in this in this webinar in, in some detail. Uh, we want this to be an interactive webinar, so you can all ask questions on the chat function, which you've got in front of you, and we'll deal with all the questions at the end, provided we've got time for them all, I'm sure we will. Um, we'll also be putting out some polls for you to answer online during the webinar, and there is a poll up already, I think, and we'll put up a second one later on during the webinar. I should also say the webinar is being recorded and we'll tweet it out again later on. So if you miss anything or have to go away, um, you'll be able to pick it up again at a later date. And can I also put in a, a bit of a um, an advert for two more webinars that we're doing. So tomorrow, Vicky Main, um, who is uh, the peer, a peer support worker in, in Wales for, uh, for CESA, uh, for the Cordero Aquino Syndrome Association charity. And she's going to be talking about her experience of Cordero Aquino Syndrome. And on Monday, I'm going to be doing a webinar about bringing a, a, a medical negligence claim in association with Cordero Aquino. Um, so just a little bit of a plug for those two. Um, so Nish, bearing in mind that today is Cordero Aquino Syndrome Awareness Day, why, why do you think it's uh, important that people generally are aware of quadriquina syndrome? So uh, I think uh, the main thing to say is quadriquina syndrome is not just um, back pain, uh, which I think a lot of people categorize it into um, out there in the public. Um, and it's a serious um, neurological condition that requires um, emergency um, uh, uh, management um, if it is compressive. Um, and it can cause permanent uh, disability and injury, especially within a young working age population, which it commonly um, occurs in. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is it, called Aquinas syndrome is not just the um, clinical sort of signs that someone experiences. They need to have the appropriate radiology as well. Um, so therefore, that's why it's so important that they have um, an MRI scan or appropriate images done in time. Uh, so we can see if there's any compression there. Um, and the fact that studies um, at the moment, what we have shows that timing and diagnosis or diagnosis and management does matter in this condition. Um, so I think those are sort of the key things, but we'll go into other things, obviously. Yeah, of course. Now, can, can you explain for everybody, and I'm sure that um, there are many people here who are very familiar with this, but could you just explain the anatomy behind quadriquina syndrome and how it arises? Yeah, so um, the way I kind of remember it is quadriquina is actually Latin. So it's Latin and it means the horse's tail. So if you think about the spinal cord, the spinal cord ends at the lower end of your, um, uh, your spinal canal, but then there's a bit of your canal right at the bottom end um, which is open and it has this horse's tail of nerve roots coming off of it. And this horse's tail of nerve roots provide um, the, the, the muscle power to your legs um, and also the sensation to your legs in addition to your bladder bowel and sexual function. So it's quite important functions. That's why if there's a compression at this level, 
um, it can cause um, uh, uh, injury or damage to your um, leg power, your sensation, your uh, bladder and bowel uh, and sexual function. Um, so that's the explanation, yeah. Yeah, thanks, Nish. And um, bearing in mind again that it is uh, Cordero Aquinas Syndrome Awareness Day, one of the things that uh, we're looking to raise awareness of is the red flag syndromes that are associated, the, associated with the onset of the syndrome. Um, and I wonder if you could just talk through the red flags um, symptoms a bit for us. Yeah, um, I think rather than uh, listing uh, red flag symptoms, which I think a lot of people tend to do online and you read this list, I think it's better if I tell you as a, as a spine, spine surgeon or a trainee, what I would ask from a &E when they refer me someone who they're worried about cord equina and the things I want to listen out for, which kind of increase my suspicion that it could be called Aquinas syndrome. Um, so basically when, when they call up, because you need to remember that um, a lot of people present with lower back pain and leg pain. So just because you have lower back pain and leg pain doesn't mean you have called Aquinas syndrome. It's a different category. So the things I would ask first of all is I would ask, you know, where's the leg pain? Is it is it one sided or is it both sides? Now if it's going down both the legs in a particular fashion, that kind of increases your um, uh, level of worry. The other thing I would ask for is, do they have any bladder issues, any bowel issues, or any sexual issues which have happened recently? So essentially, I would say, for example, with the urinary issues, are they finding that you're having a change in your bladder over the past you know, two, three days, which has happened acutely? Or is there any numbness in your genital area, what we call saddle anesthesia? Uh, or have you noticed any numbness, such as when you wipe downstairs, that you can't really feel it? Um, and I would also want to know uh, about the other things, any bowel issues and problems with having an erection or vaginal dryness, which has happened recently. And the thing which alerts me is if these things happen and have happened over the past few days, especially if it's within the past 48 hours, um, as opposed to people who have just lower back pain and leg pain, which could have happened for a long time. So those are the kind of red flag things I have. And when assessing the other things which are a bit more medical is, for example, if they put a catheter in you in A&E, whether you can feel that catheter when they tug it, because if you can't feel it, there's a higher suspicion that you've lost your sensation to that important bladder area. And when they test you in your uh, on your backside, um, the test which I want to hear is that they've uh, tested the sensation around your uh, anal area and if that's reduced or altered that again increases the suspicion that it could be something compressing on your cord equine and nerve roots and it would make me want to ask for an MRI scan yeah so I hope that helps. Yeah. yeah absolutely and you'd hope wouldn't you that in the medical profession obviously that's pretty well known although um, uh, sometimes not as much as it should be but in the general public do you think there is a real lack of awareness of those symptoms being significant yeah that that's the issue i think um because cordo is is classed as a rare um syndrome uh, and when i mean rare it's quoted in the literature i do think the rates are higher it's quoted as one per hundred thousand of population so if you take the population of the uk we have about 70 million people roughly and per year on average, there's about 1,000 operations for Cordoquina syndrome. So although it's it's rare, it's it's quite common in terms of operating on it in hospital. So I, I see it a lot as a, as a specialist, but obviously your, your public or your, or your GP primary care provider probably will only see one or two in his lifetime of his practice. And as a public, they're not as aware of it as opposed to obviously a heart attack or a stroke. So this is the thing. The other thing during my research, I found that patients found it quite frustrating when speaking to their, you know, workplaces, because sometimes I'm, I'm not saying all workplaces, but some workplaces obviously categorize this as a back pain issue uh, yeah. and don't really get it. So, yeah. OK. And then um, just in terms of some of the outcomes of Cordroquina syndrome, can you just talk through that and also talk about how 
prompt or timely surgery can help to avoid those outcomes or improve them. Yeah. So um, there, there's different outcomes from cordial equina syndrome. Okay. So essentially, um, if if you don't have very severe symptoms and say you know you're managed appropriately and everything happens accordingly, then there's a high chance that everything could be normal afterwards. Your outcome could be normal. Okay. Um, and we see that in quite a few cases. Okay. Um, in some other cases, you find that people will have some residual issues. So they have some issues with their leg power, with their sensation, or their bowel or bladder issues are kind of low level, but they're still able to sort of continue with their daily activities and their quality of life is maintained. And obviously there's the other end of the scale. So you can have someone who's presented quite late or who's got managed quite late, and then he's having, or he or she is having um, uh, permanent issues with their bladder where they need to catheterize themselves. So that's putting a tube into your bladder to empty it. Or, you know, they can't empty their bowels and they're having to use irrigation or uh, their hands to evacuate their, their bowel. Um, and sexual dysfunction. So, you know, um, they, they can't have an erection or they can't enjoy having sex. Um, and that's that's the other end of the scale uh, when they're quite severely affected. So there is a range. And sorry, Simon, what was your follow-up question? It was what's the well, reason? Yeah, really, um, uh, how is that affected by how prompt the, the how promptly the surgery takes place? Um, how does that impact on outcomes? Yeah, so um, a, a bit of a long-winded explanation to that. So basically, the short synopsis of that is the quicker you manage it, the better your outcome can be. But now the long explanation for it is essentially, if, if you think of a pyramid um, and the top of the pyramid is the highest level of research you can have, and the bottom of the pyramid is the lowest level of research you can have, what we have in cordo equina syndrome at the moment is quite low level studies. And when all of these have been done and put together, so that's the best evidence out there at the moment, it's suggesting that the best time to intervene is probably 24 to 48 hours. So when you operate or when you manage something in cordial equina syndrome within 48 hours, patients tend to have a better outcome in terms of their uh, leg power, their bladder and bowel function. Um, now the issue here is, there are other studies out there that say that timing has no effect on the outcome, okay? And obviously people have been researching different things and then pooling all the data together. So the data is really not the best quality out there. But with the best evidence out there at the moment, it suggests that operating within 48 hours of when you have these bowel, bladder issues, sexual issues, this numbness, as well as the back pain and leg pain makes a difference to your outcome. Thank you. And Anish, what, what's the importance of MRI scanning in the diagnosis and treatment of quadrupina syndrome? Yeah, I think I think herein lies the, the major issue. Um, I, I think it's critical. So um, the issue we have nationally, and I think this is across most developed countries, is that the access to the MRI scanner is available in every hospital, but out of hours, it tends to be only available in tertiary centers, very specialized centers. And so if you are a query quarter equina case over the weekend or after five, for instance, they have to discuss it, the, the A&E department or the GP has to discuss it with the tertiary center. Then the tertiary center has to make a decision on it that they want to transfer you then they transfer you over, you know, waiting for an ambulance, if you're in another hospital or other delays. And then by the time you come over to the tertiary center, that team may be busy with other emergencies. And by the time they see you and make a decision and then speak to the local radiologist, that all takes time. So by the time all of that happens, you're hours and hours into it before you can even potentially get an MRI scan. So the issue, I don't think it's, again, with a lot of issues in medicine, it's not a a problem with one individual who didn't treat you. I think it's a Swiss cheese model where the, the whole, the, the institution and the framework isn't up for it. So I feel there needs to be more availability for people to have their MRI scanned locally. Um, and that means increasing the number of radiographers who work out of hours and providing that 
as a national structure so that your MRI scan, you don't need to come to a tertiary country, you can get it done locally. And an MRI scan is very important because it diagnoses cases of cordoquina where there's a compression, which is most cases, where there's a compression on the cordoquina, and in most cases that tends to be a, a herniated disc. And with that kind of an issue, we can resolve that through an operation if it's big enough and it's pressing on the cordoquina. So that's why it's critical because the issue is reversible then. Yeah. Okay. And in terms of those kind of reforms that you think are needed in terms of availability of MRI, is that something that you think is achievable in the short or medium term or how, how achievable is that, you think? Yeah. Uh, now the now this is and this is when it gets a bit political. So the issue with cordoquina syndrome is it's rare as a condition. It's not like a heart attack uh, where much more people are getting it, or it's not like cancer which has a big emotional attachment to it that you can drive funding from from government or other sources. So the issue to get the the necessary national infrastructure you want, you have to prove it with a good study and you have to prove it to a number of people and hence why that's I'll talk about my research hence why it's a long-term approach so you have to you have to show that by operating within a certain amount of time with good level of evidence it creates definite good effect and having better services can lead to that and then by doing it in a smaller area then you say well we need to employ this strategy in a bigger area across the country and then only will you start getting the funding. But it, it's not a simple case of where you can go and say, please, can we have more money? Because a couple of people agree on this. Yeah. OK. And um, so I think it's time it's time probably that we came on to your core outcome study that you're involved in. Um, so I know that there have been studies done in uh, already in terms of outcomes, but you've talked already a bit about the limitations of those studies. Um, so how does the core outcome study that you're involved in differ from the studies done in the past and how, how will it uh, affect things going forward, do you think? Yeah, so um, to, to keep this short, so essentially uh, the issue with uh, research in general, but especially called a quantum research, is say one, one academic in America will say, well, I think leg pain is really important for quarter corner people. So let's just do a paper on leg pain and back pain. And then another researcher from the UK might say, well, no, I think bladder is the most important to them. Forget the rest. That's the one we need to target. Let's do a study on bladder. And they've done this for the past 20, 30 years. And what they do is when you're looking at different outcomes uh, and you're using different ways to measure it, and then you try and pool all this data together, you can't. It's like it's like comparing uh, apples and pears, essentially. You can't put them together uh, and then say, well, this is the best evidence that we should do it within this time or not. And that's what they tend to be doing in the literature at the moment. So the way to circumvent it is what we're doing something called developing a core outcome set, which we've done. Uh, and it's been done in many other disease areas. So what you do is you try and define what the most important outcomes are uh, for a disease area with everybody who's important in it, such as the patients and the healthcare professionals. So we did this through an international consensus. We did it through different research methods and brought people in internationally. And that's what my research was based on over three years. And we published the results of that, which have decided there's 16 outcomes with quarter quina people, uh, patients um uh, uh say feel that these are the most important areas that we should research on in the future now there's another phd student looking at how best to measure each of those outcomes so if you can imagine it if we know which ones are the most important and then how best to measure them then we can ask for funding to try and run a, a proper uh, solid study um, on what the outcomes are which can then be agreed by the international community and by doing that, then we can start putting out proper guidelines and getting proper funding for this condition. But as you can imagine, these kind of things, so in other disease areas, have taken tw 10 to 15 years to come to fruition uh, from the beginning. So it takes a long time. It's not a short term fix. Yeah. And what, what's quite interesting, Nish, because at the moment we're, we've got this poll up um, of what income, uh, sorry, what outcome after an intervention for CSD, you feel is the most important. And we've got 80% saying quality of life. 
Yeah. Um, and I, I was looking at your study earlier and I did see that um, in relation to the 16 outcomes that you yeah. talk about, um, it's very much not just the focus on bladder dysfunction and clinical outcomes, but much more or at least equally on impact on life. And so were of those 16 outcomes are very many of those about life impact is that is that right yeah so out of the 16 outcomes um one two three four five six of the outcomes are about quality of life and the issue is if you look back on the literature they've mainly focused on pain and bladder and bowel outcome as the most yeah. important for quarter patients and actually speaking them to to, to quarter quina patients through interviews and doing this whole consensus quality of life was a major thing for them and they said yeah. that's been completely ignored it, it, and and that's true of the research as well because you know it's, we're guilty of this as, a, as medical professionals especially uh, surgeons we're very much targeted toward you know the hard hard objective things we can look at and quality of life tends to be a difficult one so we tend to steer away from it. But that's the thing which my research has said, no, we have to pay attention to it. So our, my research says everyone who does a study in called Aquina syndrome should be looking at these outcomes um, across the world. So yeah, quality of life is a big component. Mm. And, and is that easy to measure in terms of the studies? Are there problems with measuring it or how yeah, is it done? Yeah, it tends to be quite subjective. So mm. in research, people like to have things objective as in binary it's one or the other um so to, to to make that happen there needs to be a good tool to assess it with and at the moment our phd student is investigating which is the best outcome tool for it so there are a lot of questionnaires out there for quality of life but it's to, not every questionnaire is really relevant for cordial quina syndrome because they have a very specific subset of issues so it's finding out which questionnaire is the best one to use uh, for these patients in future studies okay. so Okay, and uh, um, what what findings are available already from from your study? Um, I mean, other uh, other than these, are there any others, and are they being used in practice already, or yeah. where do we stand with regard to that? So the the findings have already um, been published um, uh, online. Uh, if you type in um, uh, the the authors' names and the and the Cord Aquino syndrome, you'll find it. Yeah. Um, and these these outcomes have already been instituted. There's a national study at the moment, which has been running for two years, looking at the outcome of patients with cord aquina syndrome, follow, looking at these outcomes, which I've developed uh, with the team and the patients. Um, and essentially, um, the results of that uh, are not out yet. They're just in the process of analysing everything. So that's the first study which has been done on a national basis. And I think they've recruited up to about 400 patients. So it's one of the biggest studies out there so far. OK. And when, when do you think that will be out? Probably probably with, within the next year or two, year, uh, year and a half. So we're looking at 12 to 18 months before the team yeah. months out. OK. And what, what do you hope will be the ultimate benefit of the core outcome study that you're involved with? So essentially in other disease areas where they've done this, like rheumatology and women's health, they found that when, when everybody is looking at the same outcomes and measuring it the same way, then what you can do after a certain amount of years, five or ten years, when people are doing this with their studies, is you can pool all that data together across the world. You can put that all, all together and do... Um, and sort of analyze it and see actually what is the best time at which to operate for quadriquina syndrome what what outcomes does it affect the most what outcomes does it have no effect on you know and you can do you can you can make proper evidence based guidelines and then with that you can start convincing um, you know the funders and government to give more money towards this condition so that's the yeah. ultimate aim and to set up to set up essentially a holistic service for cord syndrome because although although it's managed as an acute condition uh, at the moment there is a massive chronic component to it um, afterwards so i think you know it needs to be managed for patients who do have residual effects from it bowel bladder but also quality of life and psychological there needs to be a holistic service which offers care for the patient in hospital rather than okay well you know, your urologist will look after your bladder, 
your uh, psychologist, you know, which you'll have a 12-month wait for, will see, you know, what the emotional effect on you is, uh, and then your, your bowel function you can see a, a gastroenterologist for, but that will take another six months. So instead of having it so divided, have it all sort of together, together in one sort of holistic service. Yeah, and that's really interesting because I think that chimes a lot with um, discussions that I'll be having in the webinar tomorrow with Vicky because she's talked to me about how not joined up all of those services are. Um, you know, and even in terms of your initial discharge, you're then having to go to your GP to get referred back for um, any physio rather than, you know, why wouldn't that referral be made direct on discharge? So the whole system doesn't seem to work very well in in terms of that yeah yeah it's it's definitely not joined up yeah and um nish is is there a key message that you'd want to put out today in terms of quarter equina syndrome what what do you think is the most important message that you'd like to put out yeah i think you know quarter equina syndrome it 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 is a uh, an emergency neuro and neurological condition uh, which uh, needs to be uh, addressed acutely. Um, however, there is a chronic component as well to it for some patients, which need holistic care and attention uh, from a range of healthcare professionals. Um, and in the acute stage, the most important thing is if you have the other issues or what they call the red flag symptom, then you need to be diagnosed properly and managed within whichever setting whether that be through your gp or through a and e um because what you need to have is you need to have an mri scan to rule out if there's a structural or compression on that area so that's the take-home message acutely great thank you nish um so we've been talking for about half an hour and um we've, we've got some more time to answer some questions um, and I think we, we do have one question up on the chat, which I think is probably one that you'd be a better place to answer than me, um, about the CES clinic at the Walton Centre. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah. So there is, uh, at the moment, there is a, a Cordo Aquina Syndrome Clinic, um, which is uh, run by a neurologist. Um, with input from our surgeons um, and that tends to deal with patients who have uh, a lot of who are you remember that spectrum I was talking about that some people can be quite severely affected so it tends to deal more with that side of um, quarter equina syndrome um, but I feel the next step is we need to uh, kind of address the patients who are on the other end of the scale although their issues don't tend to be more related to bowel or bladder you know there's a lot of issues with they tend to be very scared to do anything regarding their back and i think they need some level of reassurance um and referral for physio and these kind of things and that's sort of service we need to develop but there is a quarter quina service at, at the walton center for um uh, the population of merseyside yeah okay thank you um we we don't um okay we do have some more questions coming up now um and um julie's asking what's the evidence around recurrence and should there be regular checkups so do you want to do with that nish yeah um essentially because cord equina syndrome is such a rare condition in um in a hospital uh, setting you'll probably only get you know in a big big center like ours we probably only operate on about 60 patients a year with it so to get a sufficient number to look at recurrences because again within that recurrences is very rare <laughs> so to look at that you need a very, very long study and i think you need a lot of sensors and that hasn't really been done yet now if you just look at um discs so people who have uh, an operation for a a, a disc which is the same kind of pathology you'll get in a quarter equina syndrome. Uh, the recurrence rates can be quoted sort of five to ten percent over the course of ten years. So there's a five to ten percent chance over the course of ten years that you could have another disc coming out. Um, and uh, I don't have anything to believe at the moment. There's no evidence out there to suggest that quarter equina is any different. And in terms of regular checkups, that's so the issue is even if you get a recurrence doesn't mean that we'll necessarily go in and operate 
So if even if there is a recurrence, it has to be clinically evident. So essentially, you should be having the leg pain and back pain coming again. So you would feel these things. So when you feel it, it's appropriate to get another scan just to check if it's there. You find in quite a few cases, there's there's nothing there and it's just a sort of nerve irritation and other issues. But sometimes, yes, you can get a recurrence and I've seen that and we have taken people back to theatre because it's big enough causing symptoms and operated as a, a repeat operation. And is that something that's, that sometimes happens very quickly? Because I, I've seen some uh, instances where people have ended up having two or three operations within a couple of weeks and then perhaps it's not clear whether the um, uh, original compression has been properly decompressed or whether it is a true recurrence so is that is that sometimes a bit of an issue for for the neurosurgeon yeah, I mean, it's very um it's very difficult to differentiate if it was uh, left after surgery or if it's a uh, uh, a recurrence afterwards uh, the only way uh, you could ever do that and you don't have the facilities to do that is to you know video ro video record within the spine uh, over a course of days and see what's happening but you know that's mm. you, you don't have that level of technology so you know with an operation also i think people have the impression that the whole disc space is removed it, it is not generally what happens is you remove the disc which is compressing on the nerve root and the spinal cord you don't try and remove the whole disc out of the uh, out of that area so obviously there is a there is a tendency that you could get a recurrence coming from the disc but it's 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 hard to say so you go with the clinical symptoms and obviously you scan appropriately if that happens uh, to see yeah that that's helpful and i see Julie said thanks. So I think we, uh, I think you've answered her question. We got another question from Sadiq now, who um, is saying um, he'd, he'd like a reference on the study, uh, but then has also gone on to say, is there any age or gender components uh, to quadriquina syndrome from your experience in terms of recovery and presentation? Yeah, I'll, I'll ask the second part of that question before the first. So the, so the. Um, in terms of quadriquina, generally it affects young working age adults and that's because um, if you imagine it, for the disc to come out, it needs to be a soft disc for it to come out all of a sudden. Uh, thanks Claire, I think Claire's posted the link. Um, so in terms of um, uh, the disc to come out quite acutely, it has to be a soft disc and younger people tend to have this soft disc component. So the, the soft disc protrudes quite acutely and that's why you suddenly get that bladder bowel issues coming on uh, all of a sudden. Um, and in terms of recovery, the, I think the greatest determinant of your recovery is two things. One is how you present. So if you present quite delayed, um, say uh, a week or two weeks after having these symptoms, you're less likely to recover. And the other thing is how you're managed. So if you're managed within 48 hours of you getting these symptoms, your chances of bladder recovery and bowel recovery are much higher than someone who is managed much later. Uh, so those two are the, are the big things. It doesn't, it doesn't tend to, there's no statistics out there that suggest it's more in females or males at the moment. Um, but we're working on that. Thanks, Nish. Is, it, is anybody else who's on the webinar I've got another question for Nish? Um, we had some questions uh, which were sent in early, which we can come to next, but I wonder whether there's any more questions that Nish could help people with today. But it doesn't look like it for the time being, Nish. So um, we did have some questions that were. Um, uh, sent through in advance um, and they're quite um, well they're really related to symptoms that people are having um, perhaps more than being general questions yeah. um, and I, I think probably you're in some difficulty in kind of giving an online clinic for people's symptoms but I, I don't know how you would would like to to deal yeah. with those questions I think um I think you know the main thing to take away from this is if you have any of those acute red flag 
um, issues that I was talking about, you need to present yourself to either your GP or your A&E and &E, um, I mention you have these um, issues. Um, in terms of uh, chronic management, so after the um, uh, intervention, if you have issues uh, regarding, you know, you have pain, you still have bladder issues and you want investigated further and you don't know if it's related to cord equina, I think you need to be assessed properly. You need to have the appropriate scans done and the appropriate investig investigations um, with a, a specific healthcare person, whether it's a GP or a spinal surgeon. Um, uh, rather than, I think me answering, um, uh, giving an answer online is not going to be the best way forward for that or individual sorts of issues. Yeah. In, in relation to the question about being hot all the time, can you give a just sort of generic answer to that? Or yeah, is, that, is that something that's... Yeah, that's, that's not documented anywhere to be from Cordoquina mm. syndrome. But the issue with Cordoquina syndrome is it's, remember, it's nerves that supply the lower limbs and your back. And the type of pain you can get sometimes from it is neuropathic pain. Uh, from the nerves, so that that pain tends to be quite classically burning, sort of dull, um, uh, and sometimes it can be sort of electric shock-like pain as well. So it's very nervy pain. Uh, but to be, if if you're sort of hot all over, I, I don't think that's uh, tends to be hundred percent related to Cordoquina syndrome. I would say. Okay, and and from my point of view, in answer to a couple of the questions that have been um sent in i'm not quite clear um whether maybe they would be best served by better served by legal advice so if that is something that you would be interested in then i'm doing a webinar on monday about bringing a claim for quarter equina so um if you'd like to attend that or just send me an email or contact me direct then i could be very happy to talk to you about whether there might be some um possible claim available um because i think a couple of the questions uh, sort of hint at that but it's not entirely clear so i'll be very happy to help if uh, if that's needed yeah. um and we got another question now nish um from lizzie about how frequently people find their bowel and bladder symptoms worsen after discharge so i don't know if you could um give an answer to that yeah so probably two answers, Lizzie. The, the first one is um, I don't think there's enough research out there um, to answer that question at the moment. Nobody's specifically looked at that. And secondly, I, I feel in terms of uh, bowel and bladder issues, um, it's very difficult to um, – it, it's usually whatever outcome you have straight after the operation, if something gets worse after that, it doesn't tend to be – from the surgery um, or from the condition uh, from the uh, actual operation or condition itself it can be uh, due to other issues which I think need investigating but definitely for example if your leg pain or back pain or these kind of things return then you might need a repeat scan to make sure you don't have a recurrence but it's not often that we hear that bowel and bladder is improved after the intervention and then it gets worse much later that's quite rare once it's improved it tends to be improved but it can be it can take six months to a year for neurological issues to improve after intervention. OK, brilliant. And then we've got another question from Stephanie, and this is an interesting one because it's to do with kind of long term outcomes. Um, so do, do you want to try and give an answer to that, Nish? Yeah, again, it's a it's a similar thing. Um, you know, uh, Stephanie, the, the, the issue with the research is everybody looks at outcomes up to about six months, three months, one year, and then they drop it because it's a quick, it's a quick uh, satisfaction. Then you get your data and you can put out the paper. And the issue is nobody really goes up to the two year mark or beyond. We're trying to do that now to see. And I think there is there is some level of uh, recovery. Now, the quoted figure, and this is not for quarter equina syndrome, this is just generally for neurological issues. You say your best chance of recovery, you'll probably realize within six, 12 months, people say. But then nobody has really documented within quarter equina if you can start having recovery after the two year mark. I would say it, it's the longer it takes, the less likely it is to happen as a rule of thumb um, for neurological issues. Um, uh, but the, the in I have to be honest and say nobody has really done the studies to answer that question. 
What about in terms of, um, sorry, Nish, I'm not sure if you answered that, but in terms of the nerve regeneration point, is that a you know, specific point that, um, uh, in addition to your general answer? Yeah, so the ner the nerve regeneration, so that's what I'm, uh, I meant, sorry, maybe I wasn't clear. So generally with neurological issues, if you have a spinal cord injury, for example, which cord equina is not, it's below the co uh, spinal cord. So, But if you have a spinal cord injury, then they would say your best chance of recovery is within six to 12 months. And that could be just nerve gene regeneration. Um, now, you also got to remember with nerve gene regeneration, you can have uh, issues with it as well. So, for example, people might start complaining that their pain is much worse. And then you do a scan and you say, well, there's nothing really there which is pressing on your spine but what happens is sometimes your nerves can regenerate uh, in an erratic way and cause you to have a heightened sensation of pain um, you know abnormal sensations or very innocuous stimuli can cause you to have very bad pain and that's because of abnormal nerve regeneration so you can have normal as well as abnormal nerve regeneration but the best chance for recovery is I would say about six to twelve months but as a, a premise that the, the, the evidence isn't out there for all of that. Okay, that's really helpful. Um, is there, are there any more questions? Can't see any more coming up on the, um, on the chat, um, but if there are any more, we're very happy to go on for a bit. Um, yeah, it, it doesn't look like there are any, so um, if not, um, Thank you very much. That's been uh, that's been really helpful, really interesting. Um, and um, we, we've also put up on the screen there. Oh, wait, hang on. <laughs> We're just reading the question. Okay. Impossible situation when unable to access an urgent MRI that we know is indicated. What is your advice and document? I think I think the answer to that is if you're in a uh, Linda. Um, uh, thanks for asking that question. It, the the answer to that is you discuss it with your um, uh, your local uh, neurosurgical. Um, or spinal surgery department who would be able to provide an MRI scan um, and if the registrar or consultant from that end um, says you know we we want you to scan in the morning uh, first thing or you know we we feel um, we should transfer that they will make the decision for that so you document what they say to you which I which is normally what happens in my case when people call through to me. They, they take my name and document what I've said. Um, and that would be your sort of answer to that. Um, and when I said, you know, you, you would understand being a doctor yourself that a lot of issues in medicine are not due to a single person's fault. Um, I think it's a systemic issue and uh, I think it needs to be addressed at a national level, but I don't think you can document that. <laughs> um, um, I, I don't know if that's answered it or if you wanted anything a bit more specific. Uh, okay, you said thanks. Okay. Yeah. In, ter in terms of a legal answer, I'm not sure that the trust lawyers would appreciate that sort of formulation of words because although it would be very reasonable in excusing the um, emergency doctor, it would kind of probably imply that there was quite a problem in terms of the trust but um anyway that's i think in addition to that is i think everyone that the issue is um sometimes you gotta your your advice that you give out is not necessarily the same advice you would give at another time so that's why people tend to think that as a as a specialist when you're giving out advice it, it kind of it, which way is the wind blowing because they can't figure out when you give a specific type of advice. For example, if someone um, calls at, at sort of 4 a.m. Uh, and they're very far away, um, um, I know by the time they're transferred or arrange an ambulance, 
uh, from a very long distance to come over to the Walton Center, say at 5 a.m., they're probably quicker off getting a scan first thing in the morning at 8 a.m. locally, uh, rather than transferring over to us, getting all of that arranged, being reviewed by the doctor locally, and then when they get a scan, it's many hours later, it might be easier just to keep the patient in the local hospital and get a scan first thing at 8 a.m. when they start their MRI scanners. So that, that's what, where the difference lies. And certain institutions don't like operating as an emergency after, say, you know, midnight or 3 a.m. because they feel that there's increased morbidity and complications with midnight operating, um, you know, for patients who have probably had symptoms for about a week and you're probably statistically not significantly likely to make their issues much better whether you operate up there on them at 3 a.m. or at 8 a.m. So the decision may be, well, you scan them first thing in the morning, and if there's an issue, we'll bring over and oper operate during daylight hours. So it, the, there's a lot of um, uh, variabilities, I think, uh, when you get an answer, and that's why I think people don't appreciate it sometimes, because it's not clear. Mm. So I don't think there are more questions. Um, we, there's another comment from from Stephanie saying um, th thank thanking us and thanking you, Nish, um, and saying how reassuring it is to know there are developments in treatment and care, and reiterating what we've discussed about care being really disjointed, um, and, um, and and saying this webinar really helps. So that's that's a really nice comment, and thank you for that, Stephanie. Um, and I think that might be a good good note on which to end this um, because I don't, don't think there are more questions so thank you so much for your for your help today it's been really informative and and um, and helpful um, so we'll leave you all just with uh, one more plug for another webinar tomorrow um, uh, with with Vicky Main who's going to be talking about living with Cordra Aquina and another one on Monday um, about bringing a, bringing a claim um, and a quick plug for um, tonight we have a, a quiz raising money for Cordra Aquina Syndrome. Um, so if anybody would like to join that quiz, just email me and I'll give you the, the details. Um, so um, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.